I could tell you, but I'd have to kill you. I could tell you, but I'd have to kill you. That's a line popularized by Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes story, The Hounds of Baskervilles. And since then, that line has been used in many a spy and espionage films. It's basically a clever way of saying that the knowledge I have is not for you. The knowledge I have is is not for you. The information you're looking for is above your pay grade. There are things that we want to know, things that we're searching answers for, seeking to get closure, but for whatever reason, the information is withheld from us. And as ones created in the image of God, we are wired to long for purpose and, and reasoning. We're not satisfied with the cut and dry answer of X, Y, and Z happen. We want to know why. Why did X, Y, and Z happen? And even the youngest in our society want to know. You know, I get why questions in my household from inquisitive children all the time. And then broader society longs for explanations as well. Crime investigators are always looking for a motive. Why did the criminal behave in the way that he or she did? What motivated him to pull the trigger or detonate the bomb? Why? Then you have people asking deep existential questions like, why am I here on this earth? Why did God allow unsuspecting mom, that unsuspecting mom, to back out into her driveway when she did not know that that child was hiding behind the car? How could God allow the the Muslim militants to gun down the missionary family who were committing their lives to sharing the gospel with those who do not yet know Christ? Then you have people seeking knowledge in the very book we've been studying as of late on Sunday mornings. In many of the lament psalms, various psalmists pen grief-filled psalms. You'll hear an oft-repeated word in these grief-filled psalms. Psalm 10, verse 1, why? Why, O Lord, do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? Psalm 22, verse 1, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Psalm 44, 23, awake, why are you sleeping, O Lord? Why do you hide your face? Why do you forget my affliction and oppression? Psalm 74, O oh God, why do you cast us off forever? Why does your anger smoke against the sheep of your pasture? Why do you hold back your hand, your right hand? Why, 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 and more why? Again, this question speaks to purpose and motivation. We want to know why. Arriving at the answers to our why questions helps us, to some degree, find solace. Even if we don't like the answer to the why question, it's better than nothing, right? It's just so unsatisfying when we're left in the dark, when we're left without knowledge that we think that we deserve. Oh, it must feel good to know all the answers, to be all-knowing in omniscience, at least so we think. But obviously that's not the case, and our creatureliness highlights our lack of understanding and our, our finitude of knowledge. How do you deal when you don't have the answers that you're looking for? How do you fill the void of the unanswered when the why is left nagging at you? Some say ignorance is bliss, But can we also say ignorance in some contexts is godly? If Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, the secret things belong to the Lord, our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the things, do all the words of this law. If that's true, then how do we remain content to being left in the dark with the secret things that belong to the Lord, our God? If you haven't done so already, I'd invite you to turn in your Bibles to the 131st Psalm, Psalm 131. Today we 
turn to one of the shorter psalms in the Songs of Ascent. Psalms 131, 133, and 134 all fall under the category of short and sweet. Each stands at a succinct three verses. Nevertheless, each has an important message to be heeded within the framework of all 15 psalms which make up these songs of ascent. By now you know how I take these wonderful songs. I take and understand these songs of ascent as songs intended for Israel to sing as they made their way up going out of Babylon, ascending in their return to the promised land, this land that they had once called home. And as we've been going through these psalms, I've been trying to emphasize that whoever compiled these psalms in its final form as we have in the canon today, it was done with intention. Someone had the collection of the 150 psalms and ordered them together purposefully. And even with the songs of ascent, there's a rhyme and reason to everything. The center of the songs of ascent is Psalm 127, where Solomon writes, Unless the Lord builds the house, those who labor, who, those who, who build it labor in vain. Then you have psalms like our own in Psalm 131. That if you matched it up with a corresponding placement in the whole section of Psalms 120 to 134, it has a corresponding psalm, namely Psalm 123. Psalm 123 is the fourth from the first of the Songs of Ascent. And Psalm 131 is the fourth to the last Song of Ascents. Psalm 123, if you want to skim back there briefly, Psalm 123 verse 1 begins... To you, I lift up my eyes. Psalm 131 in our psalm begins, O Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. Both songs ring full of humility. And the psalmist in 123 looks not to himself, but he looks to the Lord. And the psalmist in 131 does not lift his eyes to the things that are too lofty for him. He's humble enough not to meddle in matters that don't concern him. And even then, thematically, the two songs, Psalm 123 and Psalm 131, share overlapping themes and similarities. Psalm 123, verse 2, Behold, as the eyes of, of, of servants look to the hand of their master, as the eyes of a maidservant to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord, our God, till he has mercy upon us. The feminine imagery rings clearly also in Psalm 131, in our psalm, Psalm 131, verse 2. But I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. Maidservant in 123, mother in 131. Now, what's the point of me telling you all of this to you? By the way, I depend on all of this, these observations on one of my seminary professors for these textual observations. But the point is to inspire you to get in this book. There was so much intentionality that went behind the composition that we hold of the book we hold in our hands today. God used thoughtful, insightful, purposed minds of authors and compilers to bring this book together. There are multiple human authors of Scripture, while also there's one divine author of Scripture. And this book is unlike any other. But getting back to Psalm 131, what we have before us is a psalm of humility. A psalm of humility. Today I've entitled the message, A Godly Ignorance. A Godly Ignorance. Usually we think of intentional ignorance as a negative thing. Yet there are scenarios such that a purposeful ignorance is the appropriate and best way to deal with the situation. Many a situation requires us to lay ourselves low before the Lord. And here's the main idea of today's sermon. Hoping in the Lord and having the Lord, hoping in the Lord and having the Lord is better than hoping for and having the answers to your deepest questions. Let me repeat that theme. Hoping in the Lord and having the Lord is better than hoping for and having the answers to your deepest questions. 
The way I want to look at this this morning is through three headings. Number one, a humble avoidance. Number two, a peaceful content. And number three, a corporate call. So number one, starting with a humble avoidance, look with me at verse one in the text. The psalmist says, David, O Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. Now, when I say humble avoidance, what I mean is that the psalmist David is content to stay in his own lane. There's no swerving to the left or or to the right in order to get into someone else's business. He doesn't try to busy himself with knowledge and matters that are too lofty for him. David is pleased. He's pleased to keep himself busy with issues that are within his assigned scope of knowledge. And instead of trying to get his nose dirty in the magnificent and transcendent thoughts, he avoids it. This is one of the cases where avoidance is the right option. He says he does not occupy himself with things too great and too marvelous. What are, the th- what are, what are these things that are too great and, and too marvelous? Well, they are what the Lord has chosen to keep unrevealed. They are the things that, at this point, the Lord has deemed off-limits. A parallel for this psalm is what served as our call to worship. And what I just read for you earlier, Deuteronomy 29, 29, again, which says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God. Now let us examine for a moment the the disposition of him who seeks to stay in his own lane. He is a man whose heart is, is free of self-exaltation. Again, look at verse 1. O Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. A heart not lifted up conveys the idea of, of someone who's not absorbed in himself. He doesn't think himself better than those around him. And his head is kind of not perched over others, looking down on them usually in an attitude of snarky pretentiousness. It's a heart that knows its place, free from any need to to feel superior over others. It's a lowly heart, not for the sake of looking humble. Rather, he has accepted who he is. In that second description, eyes not raised too high. Eyes not raised too high signifies he's not after what's not his. Overly ambitious ain't something that can be said of him. He's not trying to conquer territories, obtain objects, or discern concepts that God has not promised him. And through this psalm, you can tell David has accepted his natural position as one who has been made. He embraces his lowly creatureliness in comparison to his maker. Elsewhere in the Psalter, another psalm penned by David Psalm 8, which says in verses 3 and 4, David writes, When I look at your heavens, the work of your hands, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? David has humbled himself to recognize the grandeur of his God and of his own minuteness in all of it. And it's a marvel that God is even mindful of the lowly creatures that we are. His self-understanding is is pretty accurate. There's there's no hyper-inflated view of self here. And just keep in mind those penning this letter. This is David. This is the warrior king, conqueror, conqueror of armies, courageous leader, monarch over a whole nation. It wouldn't be surprising to see someone from such a background busy himself with ascertaining knowledge and arriving at answers. Yet David will not go there. It's likely that David's penning of this psalm correlates with a difficult time in his life. And you know he faced many challenges in his lifetime. And in those moments, he had to have been asking the question, why? Earlier I read for you some of those wise psalms. 
And he couldn't comprehend why God would direct such difficult circumstances in his life. No answers were given, only silence. And the mystery was undeniable. The question was, would he cross over into the other lane, attempting to uncover the mystery? Would he force God's hand with the attitude of, tell me why or else? Suffering and mystery seem to have that effect. I'm reminded of Eli Wiesel, the, the Nobel Peace Prize winner, who experienced the darkest night of the soul through the Holocaust. And he witnessed, he witnessed things that no humans should witness or experience. And he recalls looking on as a child in, uh, in the Nazi death camp where his hopes were, quote, turned into wreaths of smoke. And he draws the parallel to his faith, writing, flames, these flames which commanded, consumed, excuse me, my faith forever. Never shall I forget those moments which murdered my God and my soul and turned my dreams to dust. How could an all-powerful God allow such evil to terrorize innocent lives. And the deep mystery of how God, a God all-powerful and all-loving, could allow something like the Holocaust to happen usually has one of two effects. It, as we see here, demolishes any faith in God or it actually draws a person to greater faith. And I would argue when it does draw someone closer, it is because that person hasn't made it his mission to get all the answers. His mantra is the same as David's. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. It seems to me a practical way of developing a heart not lifted up and eyes not raised too high is to think hard and to think frequently upon the gospel. If we can ask why would God allow evil to run rampant in this world, if we can ask that question, we can also ask why would God allow his very son to endure the sickest punishment known to man by sending him to the cross when he was altogether innocent? You might, know, you might say something like, I, I know the reason, I have the answer. The reason is because he loves us. God is love. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he sent his only son, that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. But really, why? Why does God love us? We've given him every reason not to love us. Sin is so heinous. If you could look into the depths of, of my heart, if I could look into the depths of, of your heart, we'd both be appalled. We take good things and distort them. We easily skew a situation for selfish ends. And it's for this reason that the prophet Isaiah says even our good deeds are but filthy rags. And there's the outright rebellious stuff we do. We know what is good, Yet we choose the exact opposite. We like to think that we are better than the Pharisees or better than the Roman soldiers who, who nailed the cross and the, who nailed the nails into Jesus' hands and his feet. But we're no different. Prior to our conversion, the Bible describes you and I as children of wrath and enemies. And the question comes back to, why does God love us? Why would he love us to the point of sending his very son to take on the penalty of our sins as an innocent man himself? Why would Jesus voluntarily go to the cross in order to endure such shame, to endure such divine wrath, all for people who hated him? Why? Again, you could go back to the answer, because of God is love, because God loves us. It's in his nature to love. It's who he is, even though we don't deserve it. But is that answer completely satisfying? You still wonder, why would he set his love on me? But at some point, you, you relent. Because if you continue on, where the focus becomes on the sinner, 
then the sinner can begin to actually question God's love. Is it real? How could it be? And doubt starts to, to creep in and take over. However, even with the glorious gospel, at some point, you have to come to the realization of, I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. If it is true for the gospel, it is also true for the mysteries of this life. And when God's people who truly belong to him, when they think upon this mystery, they will inevitably realize, my head is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. Whatever it may be, from wondering about the purpose of a difficult trial or even to the point of understanding challenging doctrines that can only be explained by mystery and paradox, the child of God will relent. He will not demand the answer to the point of saying, forget this God, forget him. How could he bring this suffering into my life? She will not raise her eyes up to too high, thinking, I cannot fathom an all-powerful God who would allow evil to take place in this world. On the other hand, the prideful person will go those routes. Humble avoidance is not the path that he's willing to walk down. Answers and explanations must come, or else the God of the Bible is not worthy of that person's worshipful submission. Even as the clay, he wants to say to the potter, tell me what I want to know. No heart of faith there, only self-trust. And with that said, I'd encourage you to behold this God who is beyond understanding. Give yourself a chance to marvel at his wondrous ways. He is the God who says, if I were hungry, I I would not tell you, for the world and all its fullness are mine. And elsewhere he says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. What are the questions weighing heavy on your heart today? Why did you allow my child to suffer so much? Why did you take away my spouse so early? What is the purpose of keeping me single or childless when these are God-honoring desires? Why have you allowed the church to endure such deep strife this past 2022 year? Why are you allowing society to degrade so rapidly in our day and age? Brothers and sisters, we must stay in our lanes. God may reveal the answers, or he may not. We do not need to know everything, though. And verse 1 of Psalm 131 exhorts that what the psalmist committed himself to do positively, what he did was he exercised a a humble avoidance. Well, then verse 2 focuses on what he did do. Number 2, in the heading of our sermon this morning, he positively adopted a peaceful content. Look there in verse 2. He says, But I have calmed and quieted my soul, Like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. If in verse 1, David did not busy himself with things above his pay grade, in verse 2, David positively embraces a disposition of calm and quietness. I think these two things are interconnected. You know, when we occupy ourselves with things outside of our control, we begin to get anxious. We get frustrated. We get flustered. Our hearts get busy and, and, and frantic. Our minds begin to race with thoughts of, what, what if? How come? And that's not fair. Another way to look at it is, it's a mindset discontent with living in mystery. We just spoke of a prideful person as willing to accept living in the unknown. On the contrary, Calmness and quietness of soul is the fruit of someone who's willing to live in mystery. And when you get there, it's actually such a freeing position. When you have to have the answer for everything, you are enslaved to knowledge. It tugs at you and you just can't live a settled life. But when you give that up, 
when you release it to the Lord, trusting him with the unknown and what he has chosen to remain veiled, you can actually begin to experience the peace that he longs for you to know. And in order to convey the calm and quiet that, he, that has filled his heart, David employs an effective illustration. Utilizing the literary device of simile or metaphor, a simile is when you use the word like or as for comparison, David presents a picture of peaceful contentment. First, he depicts a content child. He says, like a weaned child with its mother. And then second, David says, he is like that weaned child. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. What is the meaning of this illustration? Most of you know that children, young children, take solace in and comfort in nursing from their mothers. Our family is in that stage now where Jedediah finds security in nursing at his mother's breast, and it's a natural practice built into the creation order. Yet at some point, the child needs to be removed from his mother's breast or from the bottle, from that sucking action, to transition into eating solid food. And that's the process of weaning. And when the child gets older, he must break away from this sucking habit. Weaning is not always easy for the little ones. You know, we have a friend, actually, whose child had not been weaned even when he was in first grade. He still had to be nursed in order to, to be soothed to sleep at night. Let's just say that it's usually a lot earlier than that. And I think Natalie does not plan to wean Jed that late. But I can tell you that Natalie, she would wean him today if she, if she was able to because nursing is, is such a laborious process. Again, I don't speak from experience. I just speak from observation. But it is a laborious process to constantly feed the baby hour after hour. And I'll let you know that Jed ain't shy and other babies aren't shy when they let you know that they want to, to nurse at their mother's breast. Anyway, once a child is weaned, he or she is at peace. They no longer cry or, or get riled up at the mother's breast. There's no fussing, no restlessness, no calling for milk once the child is weaned. Again, the child is at peace. And in all of this, it's not like the, the child has the conscious thought of, you know, I, I need to start eating solid food now. I can no longer rely on, on mommy's milk. I have to consume a, a heftier substance. What baby is, is even able to think like that? But it's still a mystery to him. Yet he is at peace because he has been properly weaned. And in the same way, David has learned a peaceful contentment because he knows God's not going to give him all the answers. He may want to know, but he has to trust what the Lord has already revealed to him. And what the Lord has given is enough. The Lord has determined that he need not know more. And going back to last week in Psalm 130, he must wait on the Lord, perhaps even into the next life, to unveil the knowledge that he's seeking after. And as God keeps him in the dark, he wants him, God wants him to trust. You know, most people know that Charles Haddon Spurgeon was a marvelous preacher in the 19th century Britain. What not a lot of people know is that he also loved little ones, that is children. And speaking to a dying boy in an orphanage that Spurgeon ran, Spurgeon said this, quote, Jesus loves you. He bought you with his precious blood, and he knows what is best for you. It seems hard for you to lie here and listen to the shouts of the healthy boys outside at play. But soon, Jesus will take you home, and, and then he will tell you the reason, and you will be so glad. And I feel like I have to read this once again because it's, it's short enough, but it's just so good. Spurgeon says, Jesus loves you to this dying boy. He bought you with his precious blood and he knows what is best for you. It seems so hard for you to lie here and listen to the shouts of the healthy boys outside at play, 
But soon Jesus will take you home and then he will tell you the reason and you will be so glad. That quote for me has to be the best illustration of being simultaneously truthful and pastoral. The point of the quote is simple. In your suffering, God has not revealed why he is bringing you through it, but he wants you to trust him. Trust him even when you don't have the answers. It's when you trust him that you can arrive at a calmed and quieted soul. And that's the place where Spurgeon was hoping to help the dying boy to land by pointing him to his Savior. And I think it's the same place where David wants to help us land by sharing his own life, by giving us a window into his own heart. David demonstrates that it is possible to live a life of contentment, living in a dark world, not knowing everything that we want to know. There's a type of ignorance where it can be a godly ignorance when the heart is governed by Christ and contentment. And thinking about this passage, I'm reminded of Paul's words to the Philippians in chapter 4 that he learned in whatever situation he was to be content. Now, in that context, he was talking in a situation of living with material plenty and material want, but I think that the principle is the same. To know much or to know little. Godly ignorance is possible because Christ makes it possible. And Christ enables you to live with a calm and quiet soul even when the storms of the unknown are howling around you because he has given you himself. Do you trust him? Is he enough? Brothers and sisters, he is enough. Has your heart gotten to the place where anger and bitterness have taken over because of the darkness that he's left you in? Maybe it is that you need to confess your bitterness and and repent of it. Even Job had to. Remember Job 42? Job, he speaks back to God in response to, to God's thundering revelation of himself. Job says in Job 42, verses 2 through 6, I know that you, that's speaking him speaking to God, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know. Hear and I will speak. I will question you and you make it known to me. He's repeating God's words back to him. I, heard, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear. By now my eyes see you. Therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Job finally came grips with the mystery that God is God's that is God's will and activity, he came to the he came to the, the the peace of God's will and God's mystery, and it is also where we often need to go. So we've looked at a humble avoidance, this peaceful content, but third and, and finally, David extends this corporate call. I invite you to look at verse 3 with me. David says, O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Moving from his own personal singular voice, David calls on the people collectively to fix their hope on their God. Now, it's not insignificant that David transitions from describing his own personal experience to levying out an exhortation to the whole covenant community of Israel. And by doing this, it seems David is saying, learn from my experience. Learn from my experience. Have you ever thought about this? The the experience that one individual experiences within the covenant community, in some sense, is for the whole. Now, by the way, the psalmist in 130 does this too because it's all singular voice in verses 1 through 6 in Psalm 130, and then he moves to uh, a corporate call, O Israel, hope in the Lord, in verse 7 of Psalm 130. But that is to say, again, 
Have you ever thought about this? The experience of one is not just for that one. It is for the whole. And David's unique experience of not having answers to all the trials of his life served to inform Israel as a people. Yes, David's struggle was, again, on an individual basis, but that was not the end of it. God intended to teach others through his life and his experiences. And the individual corporate dynamic is something built into our existence as Christians. We are part of a whole. And as a member of this church, you have responsibility for the church. We should always be moving towards being a more integrated community. That's actually one of the aims of our, our monthly evening gatherings on Sunday evening, Sunday nights. For one of our gatherings this past year, I had asked a, a brother in our church community to, public share, to publicly share about his experience in processing through the sudden and unexpected death of his father. You probably know that situation, that man as David Ho, a beloved brother who died unexpectedly in August of 2020. And as you would expect, it had a tremendous impact on the family members left behind in that whole family. For, for that Sunday evening gathering, I had asked Aaron to publicly share about the grieving process in that time period after. And Aaron graciously accepted. And it was a very touching and uplifting testimony from our dear brother. It was very touching as he shared what God had brought him through. And whether he knows it or not, Aaron served our church so well that evening. His public testimony of what he went through with the loss of David helped others, the hearers, to hope in the Lord. I know that because Aaron's sharing was full of hope. And his testimony was Christ-centered even when he didn't have all the answers that he may have yearned for with the loss of his dad. And I bring this up in order to encourage you as members of this very church to be open with one another. God is bringing you through moments that don't always have answers to them. He's bringing you through them not only for yourself, but for the collective community. And your openness has the potential to help people hope in the Lord. Again, we were built and we are built as a communal people intended to be involved with one another's lives. Will you help others hope in the Lord? It doesn't have to be in Sunday evening fellowship. It can be in small groups or a one-on-one -on -one lunch meeting or just here outside on the patio after Sunday worship. But are you willing? Are you willing to open yourself up to help others hope in the Lord? Well, moreover, I also want you to notice what was once implicit has now become explicit. Earlier on, David never said that he had hoped in the Lord and his hope was subtle and veiled. However, now, through his public exhortation, David conveys what was undergirding him this whole time. It was the Lord. It was the Lord who kept him humble. And it was the Lord who kept him going. And what a satisfying place to be. Peace that surpasseth understanding guards our hearts and minds when we hope in the Lord. And in keeping with last week, I have another Corey Ten Boom illustration for you. I actually think I may have shared this before, but it's just too good not to share again. Corey Ten Boom, one of the many who hid Jews from the Nazis in her home, in her autobiography, recalls a story about her father when she was young. She recounts how she had heard some school children talking about issues on the subject of, of sex. And she didn't understand what they were saying, so she appropriately went home and asked her father. And she records that account in her book, and I have it there for you. She, she asked, Father, what is sex sin? And he turned and looked at me as he had always did when answering a question, 
But to my surprise, he said nothing. At last, he, he stood up, lifted his traveling case from the rack over our heads and, it set, and set it up on the floor. They were on a train at the time. Will you carry it off the train, Corey, he said. I stood up and tugged at it. It was crammed with watches and spare parts he had purchased that morning. It's too heavy, I said. Yes, he said. And it would be a pretty poor, and it would be a pretty poor father who would ask his little girl to carry such a heavy load. It's the same way, Corey, with knowledge. Some knowledge is too heavy for children. When you are older and stronger, you can bear it. For now, you must trust me to carry it for you. And I was satisfied, more than satisfied, wonderfully at peace. There were answers to this in all my hard questions. For now, I was content to leave them in my father's keeping. End quote. There will never be a moment when hoping in the Lord will not secure his peace that produces calm and quietness in our souls. He is our hiding place, and he is enough. And when our hope is in the Lord, ignorance is not necessarily a bad thing. In fact, it is our very Lord and Savior, Jesus, who embraced a godly ignorance in his incarnation. When the second person of the Trinity took on flesh, he accepted the limitations necessary in order to fulfill his mission. He adopted a godly ignorance in order to execute the plan that he and his father, his heavenly father, had agreed to in eternity past. Philippians 2 tells us of his divine humility where Jesus willingly accepted temporary human limitations. Paul writes of Jesus in Philippians 2, 6 and following, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And so you see here, the emptying of himself is not to say he lost his divine capabilities. It is to say he added on human nature human nature to his existence. And in adding human nature to his divine existence, he did not cease to be God. Rather, he accepted what it means to be a human. And when he acted with miraculous powers, it was by the will of his heavenly Father. But he also accepted a godly ignorance to important matters. Remember Matthew 24, verse 36, in in reference to Christ's second coming? Jesus said, But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, nor the Son, but the Father only. Now, was Jesus any less God in his ignorance? Of course not. He willingly found his joy in the Father. Therefore, he freely submitted to remaining in the dark. Likewise, Paul calls the followers of Jesus to the same disposition of Psalm 131. In Romans chapter 12, verse 3, Paul says, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment. That includes having limitations. And sometimes that means embracing ignorance. And so in doing so, may we look more and more like Jesus. Because in God's economy, it's not, if I tell you, it'd have to kill you. It is, come to me, hope in me, because I am life itself. Therefore, brothers and sisters, let us hope in the Lord. Let's pray. O Lord, my heart is not lifted up, My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me, but I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, O church, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. This is our prayer, O Lord, this day. Father, we also ask that you would bless 
the giving of your people. We pray that you would give us and cultivate in us cheerful and joyful hearts as we worship you even through offering that's given to this church. We pray that you would use the funds, help us use the funds wisely for the purpose of helping others hope in the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.